Here is an amplifier and filter that I've designed in LT Spice. We've got a high pass filter and then an op amp based non inverting amplifier and then a low pass filter. I've used the actual uh, component values that I've built onto my breadboard, so I have the exact same circuit built for comparison. Now, what we've done here is uh, I've picked a high pass filter and low pass filter. Uh, cutoff frequencies. The cutoff frequency is 1 over 2 pi RC. And what we're hoping is that the high pass filter will block any frequency below that frequency, and the low pass filter will block any frequency above this frequency. So we've made a band pass filter. We're only interested in frequencies between the two cutoff frequencies, and then I've amplified by a factor of a thousand in between. And we can simulate uh, from 1 to 10 kilohertz what this. Uh, circuit does. So I will, I can always check to make sure that my input is correct. My input should be flat, 0 dB um, across the entire frequency space. And then I can see the effect of my high pass filter. This looks like something around a 10 hertz high pass filter. And then I have an amplifier stage, which is the same thing as my high pass, just multiplied by a thousand. And then I've got my low pass filter, which is attenuating these high frequencies. And we're not very interested in the plot, so I'll, or the phase, so I will turn off the phase. And hopefully you can see this in the video, but we've got uh, a transition from uh, attenuated um, low frequencies and then these amplified uh, middle frequencies and then uh, a roll off with the low pass filter towards the end. And I picked something like 10 hertz and 100 hertz for my cutoff frequencies. So I've got a bandpass filter that's only keeping something between 10 and 100 hertz. But what you can see here is that the lower frequencies, um, like 1 hertz, still comes through. So a 1 hertz signal doesn't come through with the same amplitude as a uh, maybe like 15 hertz signal um, because it's been attenuated by the high pass filter, but it's still there. So the way you read this kind of graph is you'd say, well, the input is a one volt sine wave at some frequency, maybe 100 hertz. The output is going to be on the green line um, uh, with 56 dB. And if you were interested in seeing like what that voltage would come through as, you can change to linear instead of working in dB. Um, so if the input was one uh, volt, the output would be, let's see, at 100 hertz. Um, uh, 800 volts, so it, it would get a gain of 800 essentially. Now we're not going to put in a one volt input, we're putting in something maybe tiny like micro or millivolts to be amplified. But this gives us a good idea of the shape of the curve. Um, also what it means is that if you wanted to keep 10 hertz, but you wanted to get rid of say 5 hertz, something over here, that'd be very hard to do because this filter isn't what we call sharp. The, the slope of this line, you don't have control over. All you have control over is where the position of this line is. So that's something to keep in mind as you design your filters. Now, I said I built this uh, circuit um, and put it onto my N-scope board, and I used a microphone as the input. So I'm looking at uh, two voltages in this case. Um, the red channel one is the uh, output of the amplifier, and the green channel, channel two, is the output of the uh, low pass filter. So both of these have been high passed. That's why their mean is approximately zero. And I can talk into it like this, and we can see the effect of my voice. And you can kind of see that the amplitude of the red is bigger than green because the green has been low pass filtered. But at this uh, sweep frequency, um, you know, my, the sound of my voice is in the hundreds of hertz. So we're going too slow to see any any of that. So I will. Um, zoom in to like a 10 millisecond per division time scale. And now when I talk into uh, the microphone, we can see I've got some high frequency components of my voice in red and the, the low pass version, which is just keeping, um, you know, things below 100 hertz uh, is much smoother. Now the frequency of uh, the human voice tends to be, you know, as a peak between 85 and 200 hertz. So that's why I filtered around 100 hertz. I didn't want to keep any of the kilohertz level uh, signals. Um, that would be like instrumentals if you were playing music. Um, I can generate that with my mouth, though. I can whistle. And so you probably saw some uh, high frequency uh, sine wave on top of the red voltage, um, whereas the green filtered that out.
And an interesting uh, problem would be, how can I generate a whistle that shows up on the green one and the red one? I'd have to whistle below 100 hertz. I don't think I can do that. So here instead, I'm just kind of blowing on it, making a sound white noise. Now, in LT Spice, uh, we simulated essentially a perfect input to the si to the system, a one uh, a one volt sine wave of uh, equal magnitude at every single frequency, and that's how we were able to see the shape of this curve. I can't generate a perfect uh, input like that on my uh, microphone. Instead, all I can do is kind of blow on it, trying to make a white noise, like a sound. That should be kind of equal amounts of energy at every single frequency. And then what we can do is we can go into um, Enscope, we can save some data, so I'll go... I don't want to blow too hard. If we see it hitting plus and minus five, that's railing, that's going to mess things up. So you want to make your signal as big as you can without clipping, hitting plus and minus five. And then what we'll do is we'll take this time-based data and turn it into frequency-based data and see if we can pull out that curve uh, that we saw in LT Spice. And I'll take a couple pieces of data. One will be a whistle, just to see the, what the effect of having one really strong frequency in there is. And then I'll take another piece of data. It's more like white noise just blowing on uh, on the uh, microphone. Um, let's take a look at some code that uh, opens my uh, CSV file and uh, creates what we call the FFT, or Fast Fourier Transform, that turns my time-based data into frequency-based data. So the first thing we do is we open up our CSV file, and we append uh, all of the data out of the CSV into uh, lists. So I've got a time list, and then data 1 and data 2. That corresponds to my channel 1 and channel 2 data. And I could plot it just to make sure um, there's a sanity check that the data is there and looks nice. The interesting thing we're doing in this lab is using the uh, package NumPy uh, that I'm renaming NP to cr compute the FFT or Fast Fourier Transform of my data, taking it from the time domain into the frequency domain. Um, so there are some fixed steps to do this, and I've doubled it up here because I have two signals to work with. Um, the first thing we need to know is the sampling frequency um, that the Enscope was using. I'm going to calculate the sampling frequency by uh, looking at the length of my data uh, divided by the total amount of time um, that the, the sample happened to occurred in. Now, in, pretty soon, we'll actually be using the Enscope API and we'll be setting a desired sample frequency. Here, we still have to compute the sample frequency based on the data. Um, then we make a time vector. We, I, I'm renaming my, uh, my channel 1, channel 2 data, y1 and y2. And I'm going through the following steps to compute the FFT, here's what actually occurs, and then we're taking what they call the half-side FFT, um, so we're uh, throwing away half the data. And then I'm making some subplots uh, to show the output of the data. I'm first I'm going to show the raw time-based data, then I'll show the um, frequency-based data, as well as on a log-log plot. Um, now the FFT, we're going to cover that in lecture, so you'll see exactly the math behind doing the FFT. Um, doing the FFT in Python like this is slightly dangerous because we don't necessarily know what this FFT function does. So if you move between MATLAB and Python and any other math system to do an FFT, uh, be sure to read the documentation because they all work slightly differently and we want to make sure that we're not misinterpreting um, how this data works. Uh, so I already ran this and I, I turned my, um, my data into a PDF. So let's take a, take a look at this PDF. Here's the first uh, sample that I took. The raw data is at the top. The blue line is me whistling uh, without the low-pass filter, and the green line is the low-pass filtered version. Um, on the middle plot, we see a, uh, a linear um, frequency space and a linear magnitude plot. So this is very similar to the plot that you could make in LT Spice, uh, except on linear, linear. Um, what do we see here? Uh, let's go back and look at the average voltage from uh, blue and green is approximately zero. So we expect at zero volts, uh, or zero hertz, we'd have about a zero volt signal. So um, it must have a slight mean because at zero uh, hertz, both of them are, you know, a small magnitude. 
And then um, what this plot is showing us is what is the magnitude of every frequency represented in this data. Um, so for example, I was whistling, and it appears that my the tone of my whistle was uh, maybe 1200 hertz. And that would probably be this uh, sine wave superimposed on the blue one. And we can see it, had, it was the strongest frequency in this piece of data. It has the biggest uh, spike, the, the spike tops off at 0.5, so that means that the uh, amplitude of the sine wave uh, at that frequency is probably 0.5 volts. Um, but we can see all the other frequencies that are also um, in this sample. Uh, most of them are quite small compared to the big peak, except at the low frequency range. Now, why would the low frequency range be so highly represented? Uh, well, I was, uh, maybe I was talking in the background, or, you know, this, the sound of my voice tends to be in the low hundreds of hertz. Um, so most of the data was there, except for that big spike. And we can see the effect of the filter. The filter took that 0.5 uh, volt sine wave at 1200 hertz and reduced it to, um, I don't know, one tenth of its size. So that was the effect of the filter. Sometimes, though, we don't look at this at linear linear. Here's a log log based plot um, so that we can, uh, you know, here what we're kind of interested in was what did my filter do? And my filter was between uh, 10 hertz and 100 hertz. So most of the inter interesting stuff on the linear linear plot is all on the left. On a log log scale, uh, now most of the interesting stuff between uh, let's see 10 hertz and uh, 100 hertz is kind of in the middle so we could see a better effect of uh, what my filter did or the so let's say the unfiltered area compared to the filter area and here you can really see the effect of um, the filter um, on the blue and the green uh, the blue represents an unfiltered signal so that was what was in this uh, signal before the low pass filter so the green one uh, versus the blue one shows us the effect of the low pass filter. Um, so if you want to compare this uh, graph to the graph that you're getting from LT Spice, you basically have to remember that the LT Spice graph has a perfect representation of every frequency having an equal amplitude. In this case, the input to my uh, uh, low pass filter did not have an equal representation of every single um, uh, frequency. It had what the blue shows, and then the filter turned it into the green one. Okay, let's look at one more piece of data. Um, here's me more like blowing onto the filter, trying to simulate white noise. So I, I want something like... Whew. Okay, and now we can see on the linear linear scale, um, all of the uh, signal that came into blue has... Um, you know, everything's basically below 2 kilohertz. There's, there wasn't any higher uh, frequency in there. Um, below 1,000 hertz... Uh, there was a lot of signal, let's say, between 500 and 1,000 hertz. And the effect of the low-pass filter uh, said, well, I'm only interested in things about, uh, between 10 and 100 hertz. So at 100 hertz, um, the green signal starts to become much smaller than the blue signal. And we can see that the effect of the uh, filter more kind of better on the log-log based uh, plot. Okay, there's a lot of math that goes into this. Uh, one key thing is that there is a maximum frequency that the FFT can resolve. That's called the Nyquist frequency, and that is half the sample frequency. So I didn't show uh, what that calculation was, although it was used in the calculation in Python. Um, but here the, uh, the sampling rate must have been 10 kilohertz. So the highest frequency we can resolve is uh, 5 kilohertz. Um, the 0 hertz component shows us the mean. That's interesting. Note that the data points aren't evenly spaced. Uh, or, well, they are evenly spaced, but when we go to the log-log plot, that means they're no longer evenly spaced. So when we're trying to look at this data, we have lots of data up in the high-frequency range compared to not so much data in the low-frequency range. So when you're thinking about how do I you know, increase the resolution of this uh, graph, because I want to see more, maybe more data points between 100 hertz and 1,000 hertz, um, you have uh, two options. One is you can increase the sample frequency um, or the other is take more data. So in this case, I only took um, 120 milliseconds of data. Um, if I had taken a whole second worth of data at this frequency, I would have just had more data points to put into my FFT. So what we're going to be doing with this from now on is um, using the data that we record to choose the filter frequencies. So the first thing we'll do is we'll try to amplify signals that we acquire so that they're big enough to see. We'll take the FFT of that data to see what the frequency contents are. That will help us pick 
uh, high pass and low pass cutoff frequencies to say pick, well, I'm only interested in this case in maybe, um, you know, the 10 hertz range, but I, I want to make sure that I remove noise that is at 1000 hertz, so that'll help me choose my uh, high pass, low pass, and gain 